and 283 through 290 in your textbook. In section 5.2, we will discuss a simulation test for a difference in proportions. Recall when working with two categorical variables, we will find the conditional proportion of success within each group. The subscripts denote groups, pi represents the population proportion of successes, and p hat the sample proportion of successes. The null hypothesis will always be that there is no association between the two variables, or that the two conditional proportion of successes are the same. We could write that in three different ways using notation either that pi 1 minus pi 2 is equal to 0, that pi 1 is equal to pi 2, or that pi 1 divided by pi 2, or the relative risk, is equal to 1. The alternative hypothesis still depends on the research question. We could use any of the three notations seen in the null hypothesis, and we would just need to change the equal sign to any in any of them to a greater than less than, or not equal to sign, based on what we hope to prove. Here, it is extremely important to use informative subscripts or define what 1 and 2 are. Saying pi 1 is less than pi 2 tells me nothing if I don't know what 1 and 2 represent. For example, in the swimming with dolphin study, we could write the alternative as pi 1 minus pi 2 is greater than 0, where 1 equals dolphin and 2 equals control. Or, we could write that as pi 2 minus pi 1 is less than 0, where 1 equals dolphin and 2 equals control. I could also switch the subscripts, 1 is control and 2 is dolphin, and that would again change the sign in the alternative. Big idea, define your subscripts. In any hypothesis test, what do we assume? We assume the null is true, in this case that there is no association between our variables. What does no association mean? It means both groups have the same conditional proportion of successes. Think back to section 5.1 intro PowerPoint. How did we create a table representing no association? Well, if you look back on that PowerPoint, this will give you a good idea of how to create a simulation which assumes the null hypothesis is true. You'll do this by hand and using the applets in the revised exploration and it's discussed in far more detail in the wrap-up to be sure you have the right idea. How will we get a p-value after creating many, many simulations? The same as we always have. We'll compare our observed statistic, the observed difference of proportions, to the simulated statistics, or the simulated difference of proportion, from many samples where we assumed no association. Our p-value is still the probability of seeing the observed sample data or something more extreme, if the null hypothesis is true. And how will we use our p-value to assess strength of evidence? Again, the same as we always have. The lower the p-value, the stronger the evidence against the null, of no association, and in favor of the alternative, the research conjecture. Medical methods for doing a hypothesis test or creating a confidence interval for a difference in proportions. Again, the central limit theorem is here to rescue us. The central limit theorem says that under certain validity conditions, the difference in sample proportions will be distributed normally, centered at pi 1 minus pi 2, with standard deviation root pi 1 times 1 minus pi 1 over n1, plus pi 2 times 1 minus pi 2 over n2. Notice this distribution solely relies on pi 1 and pi 2, things we are hypothesizing about, so we can actually use the normal distribution now instead of the t. Normal distribution is used any time you are working with proportions. A t distribution is used for means. Since we are assuming the null is true, we must assume that pi 1 minus pi 2 is equal to 0, or simply pi 1 is equal to pi 2. Using this assumption, we can simplify the distribution from the previous slide so that the distribution and sample proportions under the null hypothesis will be distributed normal, centered at zero, with square root pi times one minus pi, o times one over n1 plus one over n2.
where pi is equal to pi 1, which is also equal to pi 2 under the null hypothesis. So we know the center of the null distribution is at 0, but what should we use for pi? We have a p hat 1 and a p hat 2, but we want to force those two proportions to be the same. Recall in section 5.1 PowerPoint, we wanted the proportion of success to be the same in groups 1 and group 2, then we will use the marginal or overall proportion of successes to find each cell count. We'll use the same idea here. So we're going to use our overall p hat in place of pi to calculate our standard error for the difference in sample proportions under the null hypothesis. Make sure you work through a few problems like this in your calculator. Most people who try to do it all at once can get very wonky answers. Be careful with parentheses, and I would recommend in your calculator doing 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2, then multiply that by p hat, then multiply that by 1 minus p hat, then take the square root at the end. So your standard error under the null hypothesis of the difference in sample proportions is the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat times 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. That allows us to calculate our standardized statistic. We'll use z since we're using the normal distribution. Our statistic is the difference in sample proportions. Our null value is 0, and we just talked about the standard error. So our standardized statistic will be p hat 1 minus p hat 2 divided by the standard error just discussed. Well, there is no null hypothesis, so we do not assume that pi 1 is equal to pi 2. Therefore, we'll simply use the proportion of success in each sample to calculate the standard error of the difference in sample proportions. In a confidence interval, the standard error of the difference in sample proportions without assuming pi 1 is equal to pi 2 is written as the square root of p hat 1 times 1 minus p hat 1 over n1 plus p hat 2 times 1 minus p hat 2 over n2. Then we can calculate our confidence interval by finding our statistic p hat 1 minus p hat 2 plus or minus some multiplier which will be given times that standard error that we just calculated. Since we are back to the normal distribution, it is the same multipliers as in unit 1. A 90% interval would use 1.645, 95% would use 1.96, and 99% 2.576. Be sure when interpreting confidence intervals to include the order of subtraction, either by explicitly writing it in the interpretation or stating that one group is higher than the other. Finally, we have to check that validity condition in order to use the normal distribution. Recall in Unit 1, the validity condition required 10 successes and 10 failures for a single proportion. Well, now we have two groups, so that validity condition must hold within each group.